All right, so Genesis chapter 1, we're going to get it down to verse 25. We're not going to finish all six days of creation. We're going to get through all five days in the beginning of the sixth day of creation. Um, and then we'll pick that up next week, and I'll tell you a little bit more why we're doing it like that as we go. But the work of Creator God is the title of this study. Um, before we actually get into the text, it's going to be a little longer than normal uh, introduction. I always take the time to give an introduction to the book to hopefully help, you know, frame it for us as we think about studying and going through. I want to take a couple of extra moments to, that, to do that with the book of Genesis because, man, there is no portion of scripture that has been attacked more than the opening chapters of the book of Genesis. And I think that will become pretty apparent here in just a moment. We believe that Moses is the author, although his name is not, you know, and this work was penned by me, you know, Moses. Uh, but this book and the next four books are known as the Pentateuch. And traditionally among the scribes and the nation of Israel, it has been Moses. The church fathers believe this. But, but Jesus did indicate that Moses was a writer of scripture in Luke 24, 27. He says, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So what scriptures did Moses write? Because Jesus clearly says that he did. And therefore, the traditional view is that it, are, it is these five books. So Moses is writing Genesis. He would have been, we don't have a, a, a methodology of which he wrote meaning we don't know how he came upon this information. We know that he was inspired of the Holy Spirit. Was there good oral tradition that remained and was passed down in all likelihood? Um, that is the case, along with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to oversee that it was accurately written down. Um, that is a good way to anticipate this information um, coming to him and therefore to us. The importance of the book. Well, the, the book of Genesis means beginnings or origins. And the importance of this book, I don't believe, can be overestimated, specifically the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. Um, the greatest controversy is going to surround the first two chapters. But the book of Genesis answers a lot of questions. And if we don't have it, it will leave us with even more questions than we have um, already, because in this book, we find out the origin of the universe. We find out the origin of life. We find out the origin of man and the origin of marriage. We find out why there is sin and evil in this world. Answers a lot of questions when you know that. When you study the book of Genesis, you understand this is a fallen world. It helps us to understand. It speaks to this of the origin of God's plan to redeem mankind. It speaks of the origin of blood sacrifice, the origin of language, the origin of government and nations. It also tells us about the origin of Israel, God's chosen people, and it even gives us teaching on the Trinity. So you see, the first chapters of the book of Revelation are packed with theological significance. So we should study them. We should read them. And if you are one that has maybe heard a few criticisms and has pushed you back off of a, a diligent study in the book of Genesis, I hope today to persuade you to dive back in. Think of it on another level. Not only those topics are covered, but if you were to get rid of the book of Genesis, it would be like getting rid of the foundation of a building. In the New Testament, there are over 200 either allusions or quotations from the book of Genesis in the New Testament, which is inspired of the Holy Spirit. So this is a key book to our understanding and to our foundation. Think about it in these terms, the importance of it. Some would say, that the opening chapters of the book of Revelation, actually Genesis, are, I went all the way to the end there. There, now we're done with the Bible again. How'd you like that? In one Bible study. It took me five minutes. That's pretty good. But if, if the book of, of Genesis, I, I almost wanted to say Revelation again. That's weird. But um, in the book of Genesis, people say, oh, it's allegorical. 
This is something that is, you know, it's just a, it's a story. It's not really a narrative. It's not in an account. Um, so we can't really pay attention to it. But I want you to think through this. If it is allegorical, it's not really significant, it doesn't really hold for us deep theology, then how can we find the elements of the gospel in, in this message? Think about this. In the opening chapters of Genesis, and if you've never read it before, you'll see it as we go. In the opening chapters, you're going to find out that man sinned against God and that his fellowship was broken with God. Does that have any place in the, in the understanding of the gospel? Well, certainly it does. In the book of Genesis, we find that God sacrificed animals and gave Adam and Eve a covering, and therefore the shedding of blood was given for sin. Does that have any relevance in the gospel message? We find that God promised he would deliver man and crush the head of Satan, the deceiver. Does that have any place in the life and the ministry of Jesus? So you see, if you say, oh, it's just allegorical, it's just poetry, no real theological significance, then what does that mean about the gospel? Because those elements that we read first there in Genesis are foundational to the message of the gospel. You know, sometimes we hear things about Scripture and we don't understand the full weight of its implication. It's kind of like dominoes. You know, you hit one domino and, um, you know, you've maybe set them up. I've never had patience to do more than one box of dominoes. You know, have you ever seen those things where they set up like whole rooms of, I'm just like, you, that, you must be really bored or you must really like dominoes. But I mean, you, they'll set up these whole elaborate systems of it. I, I like to watch it. I wouldn't want to set it up. One domino push, no big deal. But if you push one theological domino that says this is allegorical and it has no meaning or significance, it has profound impact on your entire faith. I remember when I was, um, we lived in Australia as missionaries in our first couple of years uh, in ministry and marriage. And while I was there, I went to a, a seminary, took some part-time classes, and um, partway through this class, I realized after being in there, because the guy never stated it once, um, what the, he believed, you know, the, the date of the Exodus was. And he gave a date that was um, much later and um, then the, um, you know, where we believe the, the Exodus took place. And as I heard it, I thought, if he believes that, then I bet he doesn't believe in a literal crossing of the Red Sea. And if he believes that date, then I bet he also doesn't believe that it was a large number of people that led, uh, were led out of Egypt. I bet he believes it's just, because I, I, I suddenly began to put things together. I heard him talk for a long time, and I went up to him and I said, so you believe in a, um, a, a late exodus? He goes, yes, I do. I says, I says, so the implications of that, to me, as a, a conservative Bible-believing, um, you know, student. And he says, well, you know, these are things for you. I said, well, but now let me ask you a few questions. And sure enough, all those things that I thought because of the date that he chose were true. Now, it's just a date. But that date began to have a huge unraveling, which brought it all the way back to the place. Well, where do you believe the Word of God even stands? When it gives an account, it's something, well, we need to really, you know, look it out and see if it's true or not. Oh, okay, I'm dropping your class. I don't have time for this. I have other things I can do, other classes I can take. And that is something that happens in the book of Genesis where people will make statements like, oh, it's all allegorical. The Sumerians, the Canaanites, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, they all had similar types of creation accounts and you know we know those aren't real so this is just in a long list of uh, a genre um, allegorical creation accounts but yet that is not the way it is written it is not written like those and these are recent accusations and criticisms that have come against the book of Genesis to try and dismiss its authority to speak about where life and creation how it happened. So all kinds of things end up happening as a result of dismissing the opening chapters of Genesis. I want you to look at that opening 
sentence in the book of uh, chapter 1, verse 1 of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you believe that one statement and you allow the full ramifications of those truths to be developed from this one sentence, it will solve the problem of atheism that says there is no God. Because this says, in the beginning, what? God. It will deal with the problem of polytheism that says there are many gods because we're reading about one God. It will deal with the problem of evolution because we find out there is, that is creation. It will deal with the problem of pantheism that says that God is in everything. What we find out here is that God created the world. It will deal with the problem of materialism that believes that all that has ever been or will ever be is matter. Because this tells us that in the beginning, God brought matter into existence. He is a creator. And it deals with fatalism that says there's no purpose to my life. No, you, you have a creator God that is interested in you. Fatalism certainly can be attached to evolution. But this one sentence touches so many important truths. We'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through. Uh, one way to outline the book of Genesis is to key in on a Hebrew phrase, Ella Toledot. And it simply is translated, these are the generations, or this is the family history, or this is the history of descendants, or this is the account. It's translated differently, but in the Hebrew, it's just those two simple words, Ella Toledot. And as you go through this, this forms a... Um, an outline for the book of Genesis. And we'll talk about this as we go through, but Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, the prologue becomes one. The heaven and the earth, uh, chapter 2, verse 4, is we get the history or the generations of the earth. Uh, chapter 5, verse 1, we get the history or the generations of Adam. Chapter 6, verse 9, we get the history of the generations of Noah. Chapter 10, verse 1, we get his sons. Chapter 11, verse 10, we get Shem. 11, 27, we get the generations of Terah. Terah was the father of Abraham. Um, chapter 25, verse 12, we get the generations of Abraham's son, Ishmael. Chapter 25, verse 19, we get the generations of uh, Isaac, his other son. And then we go into chapter 36, verse 1 for Esau, and chapter 37, verse 2 for Jacob, and it follows his sons to the end. So this is a way that, if, you know, it's not immediately obvious to us as we read it in the English, but it is a very distinct pattern that is found um, there in the book of Genesis. So I'll note that as we go through the book of Genesis, I realize I went through that fast, but let's... Um, Let's look at verses 1 and 2 here. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And the darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So here we see that God is creator. But again, there's, there's two more points I want to bring to us before we really get deep into the text. Uh, some other ideas that are out there surrounding the creation account. And there in between verses 1 and 2, you have verse 1, you have God basically creating the planet, if you will. The sphere is there. But then we read that it's without form, it's void. There's, it's not an inhabitable planet that is full of beauty and wonder and creation. But, you know, the sphere has been hung in space, if you will. And many people see between verses 1 and verse 2 what is called a, a gap theory. How many of you have ever heard the phrase gap theory before? Okay, a good number of you have heard of this. The gap theory states, and I'm just going to read to you, a widely held opinion among fundamentalists is that the primeval creation of Genesis 1-1 may have taken billions of years, taken place billions of years ago, and that all the geological ages inserted in a tremendous time gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. So by, at the end of chapter 1, a gap begins of billions of years. When you get to verse 2, now it's a uh, 
you have uh, the finishing touches of the creation. I don't believe this, by the way. The latter, verse 2, is believed by the, these expositors to describe the condition of the earth after a great cataclysm terminated the geological ages. This cataclysm, which left the earth in darkness and covered with water, is explained as a divine judgment because of the sin of Satan and rebelling against God. Following the cataclysm, God then recreated the world in six literal days, Genesis chapter 1, verse 3 through 31. So it's a gap theory. Now, you don't see that when you read this because it's not there. It's something that has to be inserted. Why would you come up with this idea that there was billions of years that existed between 1-1 one, one through 1-2 one, when you, it's nowhere in the text? And the answer is because uh, science has long stated and said, um, and I'm not necessarily agreeing with their conclusions, that you know when you go to uh, the geological record, the rocks and the strata speak of millions and billions of years, not of thousands of years. So some feeling compelled to have to have an explanation to why there are millions of billions of years when God's word only speaks of thousands of years. They then insert that long period of time right there. These are still people who believe in the creation account, but they will place it there. But here's the problem, one of those domino things, right? Here's the problem. When you say, yes, I, I believe in the gap theory, and I believe there were billions of years that took place between um, uh, the, the six-day creation account and verses one and two there. Well, the problem with this is by inserting and accepting those billions of years then you also have to accept the fossils that are embedded in that billions of years. And when you look at the fossil record, and they usually date these to billions of years old, 60 billion years old, 80 billion years old, the T-Rex or the you know, uh, you know, other dinosaurs, and they'll say that this is how old they are. Well, you've accepted a gap theory, and now in this gap theory, you have billions of years, but you have the fossil records that are there. And what you have in the fossil records is suffering and death and disease. They can even tell that in some of these um, uh, fossil records there was cancer. There was all kinds of uh, death and destruction and suffering that took place. Not every fossil shows that, but some fossils will show that. Okay, well, what's the problem with that? Romans chapter 5 verse 12 is the problem. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man, Adam... Sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. How did death end up on a planet that God made that was good? Well, it came through sin. Where did sin come from? It came through one man. So you have death before you have the man who sinned. It does not fit the teaching and you do not have a, a good created world as we read it later on. So this is why people will accept a gap theory because they're trying to account for the billions of years that they say it has taken for this world to um, evolve. And so they say, well, no, it's not evolution. It's just that there was this, this you know, world where Satan was and he sinned and he rebelled and then it was destroyed. Um, and that's read in verse two. But in verse three, finally, um, God recreates. But in that time period, it was billions of years, tens of billions, 80 billion years or more, hundreds of millions of years. Because they're trying to account for that. And I am no scientist and I'm not going to pretend like I am one. But I just want to say this about um, the testing that is done. Um, I know just for example, one, two examples of, of when they've done some testing. And they said that they believe this, so the T-Rex is something like 60 billion years old and the, the duckbill platypus is 80 billion years old, these dinosaurs. But in recent years, they have found the, these uh, fossils and they found that there was still tissue and, um, and soft tissue and even blood cells. So they know that you know, create uh, that material life, you know, plants and, um, you know, animals, that it cannot last. There's absolutely no way that it could last for more than 100,000 years. 
that it all fully is decomposed and gone by then. And yet they say these are 80 billion years old or 60 billion years old. So when you look at this, they've got problems in their own dating system. They begin with the premise that this world has never changed. That it's through slow, incremental changes, we have finally arrived to the place where we are today. It's called uniformitarianism. It's never been any kind of major changes, just these slow, incremental changes, gradual decay, gradual erosion, gradual evolution, they'll say. But here's the thing. That's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible tells us that there was a a moment in time when creation happened. And then it tells us there was a moment in time when the flood took place and this world was cracked apart and the deeps were open and volcanoes were erupting and this world was changed. And a lot of that can explain for the pressure um, and the difficulty that um, this world went through and could give an old dating. So these are just some things for you to search. If you really want to dig into this, There's a book called Thousands, Not Billions that I would encourage you to read. And um, you can can dig into it. So this is kind of the the evolution theory. It's also um, the, uh, um, the gap theory. But one last point. I said there was one before we get in the text. Actually, there's one more. And that is, um, when we go through this, we're going to see there are six days of creation. The word for uh, day is the Hebrew word yom, Y-O-M. And um, when we read this, we're going to say, the mo- we're going to read the morning and the evening were the first day, the first yom. And so we reread that. When you read it naturally, you're like, oh, that's a 24-hour period. But again, because evolutionists must have billions of years And some who call themselves theistic evolutionists, those that believe God started the evolutionary process, but it still took billions of years, they look for a way to insert billions of years into the uh, creation account. The only place you can really do that is to say that the word yom does not mean a 24-hour period, but it refers to billions of years. And so you have each epic or each age, each day of creation represents tens of millions or billions of years. Why? Because they need that for evolution to be true. So the word is yom that we're talking about. Now words can have different meanings and the word yom can refer to long periods of time or it can refer to a 24-hour period of time. How do you know? Based upon the context. Based on the context, how is the word used and what other words are used around it? And that gives you meaning. It's no different than how the English language or any language works for that matter. So the Hebrew word is yom. But what we read there is that evening and morning were the first day. And we know that there was a, uh, you know, the sun was given to rule over the, the day and the moon was given to rule over the night. These, this is the same kind of day that we have. And so when you find the words evening and morning and yom together 100% of the time, not 99.9, 100% of the time in scripture, it always refers to a 24-hour period. Anytime you find the word evening with yom, it always refers to a 24-hour period. Anytime you find the word yom, day, and um, morning or evening by themselves, 24-hour period. So this is always the case. Uh, When yom is used with a number as part of an ordered list, first day, second day, third day, like the six days of creation, it is always, without exception, translated as a normal, ordinary day. So, you know, people can say, well, you know, yom can mean more than just 24 hours. Yeah, you're right. But if you look at it in the context and you compare how it's used in the rest of Scripture, Never, ever, not once, does the word day, when used the way it is in Genesis chapter 1, mean billions of years. It only means a 24-hour period. So you can say that you're a theistic evolutionist and you believe it took forever to, for this you know, to happen. You could say you're an evolutionist. You don't believe in God at all, but it took forever. But what you can't do, honestly is come back to Scripture 
and just insert your idea and your theory and trample what the plain language of Scripture is saying. Hold your theory if you want to. I don't agree with it. But you can't just come and change what the text says. That's not being honest. Why would you want to change what the clear reading of Scripture has to say? Moses, in other places when he wrote, believed he was referring to literal days. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And he talks about how you should do no work and who should not do work. And we come to verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. I mean, as Moses writes, you can see he feels like he's dealing with literal days. The Sabbath was a 24-hour period. And he, he says we have the Sabbath because the Lord rested on a day. And so you can see how he's viewing this all in a very literal sense. Um, even Jesus believed that things happened um, in short order. In Mark chapter 10, verse 5, Jesus answered and said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation of God, God made them male and female. At the beginning of the creation of God, boom, there was man. Not some long evolutionary process. At the beginning of the creation. Where's the beginning? Well, we're reading it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We'll get to the creation of man in a little bit. So, Scripture is, never speaks of these long ages, these long epics of time, billions of years. I know many people believe it, but it is not being true to the text. It's not being true when you study it linguistically to say that it's referring to long periods of time. Now, that may not change your opinion about theistic evolution or evolution, but hopefully you can understand you can't just take the Bible and insert your meaning and make it say whatever you want it to say. Words mean something. Well, it's just allegory. Yeah, but nobody's ever taken this as allegory. And through the history of the, of the, of the nation of Israel, not until the 17th century was this idea ever even suggested. And this is about the time you see the theory of evolution taking root and becoming popular. So, listen, this is, this is something that I think we need to be careful of. Understanding the dominoes that fall when you accept one thought. I do want to get into the text here, so let's begin reading there at verse 3 on the first day of creation. We read, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So God put some light source there on the first day of creation in this dark and uh, voidless uh, creation. Again, many people will object and say, well, yeah, but you see, here's the problem. The sun isn't created and the stars aren't created yet. And it's saying that there's light. And we know that's how the world gets the light. So therefore, this cannot be trusted. Well, let me ask you this. If you can believe that God created the sun, which allows the, the light waves to come to us, why is it that God couldn't create similar light waves in a temporary setting on the first day of creation? <laughs> This is not a challenge if you can accept the first sentence of the book of, of the Bible. In the beginning, God created. God's able to speak these things into existence. So if he wants there to be light, he can say, let there be light. And he can do that without the sun that he's going to create later that will also give light. It's the same God that's, that's shaping and making and forming these things. And day two. We read in verses 6 through 8 about this firmament or this expanse between the waters. This is then God said, let there be a firmament, an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. So you have this water source, and it's like God is inserting, if you can imagine this, all this water, he's inserting this expanse 
You know, below the waters and above the waters. The, wa- the below waters are the oceans. The above water is a canopy of water that no longer exists. That on the, uh, the day of the flood, it no longer was there. But that's what we're reading about here. Verse 8, God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. Interesting about this canopy of water, this expanse between the waters, if that understanding is correct, that you have this canopy of water above, you have this expanse, something like the, you know, our atmosphere where the birds fly and so forth, and then you also um, have the, the created world upon it, there would be certain benefits as a result of having a canopy of water. And Henry Morris, the founder of the Institute for Creation Research, gives five different points. One, he says, would provide a uniform, pleasant, warm weather around the world. So wherever you were on the world, it would have been a a very nice uh, temperate climate. You wouldn't have hurricanes and tornadoes, no windstorms. You wouldn't have had rain. This is why when the Lord tells him he's going to flood the earth and He's like, yeah, what's, what's all this rain stuff you're talking about, right? He, this has never happened. Um, and there would have been a greenhouse effect. So it would have been lush vegetation all over the earth. And this is the one I find the most interesting is that canopy would have filtered out the ultraviolet and the cosmic rays that come down and provided longevity of life and health. And so animals and humans could have lived for a really, really long time. So when you read about people living for a long time, This portion of scripture helps us to make sense of it because it provided this perfect environment. You weren't having, you know, the fall of man. And so, you know, you weren't having the mutations that were taking place and disease and sickness entering it. So man was created and lived a long time. But at the the flood, this water canopy collapses and man no longer lives long life afterwards. In verses 9 through 13, you have day three where there's land and vegetation are created. Then God said, let um, the waters under the heavens gather together in one place and let the dry land appear. So land is formed um, in the midst of the seas. And so it was, God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God said it was good. Verse 11, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb. Uh, the herb that yields seeds and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind. Here's a phrase that's going to come over, kind of happen over again and again. And it's the word kind. Species is the idea. Whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind, and God saw that it was good, so the evening and the morning were the third day. So things are, each day of creation has a different elements of this life that we're familiar with that are being added. In day four, the sun, moon, and stars are brought into being. God said, let there there be lights in the firmament. So the expanse was not only where the stars were, but we're going to read here in a moment, where the birds also flew. So you had kind of a lower, uh, an upper and a lower firmament that's being referred to. So let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Underline that. What is the purpose of stars? It helps with our calendar. It's not to guide your life. You, you don't need to consult your lucky stars to find out whether it's a good time to buy, sell, marry, wh- whatever, get, take the job. Don't consult stars. Don't concern the, consult the lights in, in the heavens. Consult the light maker. Consult the one who made all of these things. Romans chapter 1 warns us about how mankind began to worship their creation rather than the creator. Jesus is called the light of the world. If you want to consult light, consult the light of Jesus Christ. Your maker, also your redeemer, wants to dwell within you and wants to lead you and guide you through this life. You consult the scriptures. You consult the maker, the one who knows all of these things. So the star is not given to guide us through this life. They're just helping us with our calendar or maybe some navigation. Keep on reading verses 20 through 23. Then God said, 
Let the waters abound with abundance of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament. So that lower part of the firmament of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God said that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. By the way, this is where dinosaurs, as we call them, would have been created. It was on this day. Are dinosaurs real? Yeah, they're real. We, we have the fossils of these things. They're just not 80 billion years old. They were created at this time period. They were created at this. Well, where are they today? Well, you know, after, you know, after the fall, there are many animals that don't exist. And, you know, after the, the flood, um, this was a problem too. But there are, there's mentions of other dinosaurs. Um, in the book of Job mentions some of them. So um, the idea that dinosaurs exist is not simply an evolutionary idea. It's just one of God's creations. And it would have happened on, on this, um, this day, um, actually day uh, six that we're going into, where animals are created. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, cattle, creeping things, and the beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. And so it was. And God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. So those are the begin five full days of creation, part of the day of, of creation six. So God is the maker of this. He has created all things that exist. Again, theistic evolutionists, those who say, no, um, God started the creation and then evolution, evolution took place. They're, the big problem with that is they need billions and billions of years to, to see this happen. And I just don't believe the Bible teaches that there are billions of years. And there are some other scientific problems that I'm not going to get into. Maybe I'll re, I'm planning on talking about next week. But for the person who's the evolutionist and does not see God, they're an atheist and they see that there is no God. But God created all things and he spoke things into existence. This building, when it was being made and being created, there was all kinds of deliveries. There was lumber deliveries, there was carpet deliveries, there was paint, nails, screws, steel. It all came in. And then skilled individuals made it. But they used material that was provided to them. God made the material when he created this world. He brought it together. The, the evolutionary theory of the, you know, the most popular one, Big Bang, was that out in space, and where does space come from, by the way? You got space, but where does space come from? Well, there was this explosion. Well, wh who ignited that? Where did, the, where, where did the, the, the elements that were needed for an explosion to take place come from? Well, it exploded, and then it all mingled together. Eventually, it settled down, and this information came together. And it began some very simple um, types of um, organisms, simple cells, and they just began to develop over and over again. Well, all of that requires information, doesn't it? Where does creation get its information from? From the informant, God. Where does evolution get its information from? They don't know. They have no answer. This is a big problem for the evolutionists, and if they're honest, they, they admit that. Well, it just was really simple information, which is not really so simple, we found out. The simple cells, very complicated. But, but let me just give you this kind of, this illustration. I've used it before. But let's say you're at the beach, and on the beach, um, you run into uh, Rebecca, my wife, and myself. And we're standing there, and you see a heart that's been drawn in the sand, and it says TW plus RW. There's all kinds of information in that, right? But you come in and go, oh, you guys did this. And I said, no, that last wave that rolled in did this. Would you believe me? The wave came in, it created a heart shape, and it just so happened to put our initials together. And we are a loving couple, and it's just, we're amazed. I mean, this is just amazing that it happened. You wouldn't believe me? 
But how crude is that information? It is like so simple. I mean, even if you took our initials out of it and you just put a heart there, you could gain, well, there, somebody's in love around here or wishing for love, who knows? But love was on somebody's mind. Just that simple little symbol would tell you that. If you were to go hiking today and you were to go up in the Blue Ridge or up in Nelson County and you discover a cave that nobody has been in for a long, long time and in this cave you look up and your, flat, your headlamp goes and you see these, these real simple you know, symbols, stick figures of people and of, of animals and you see spears in their hands, some kind of tools and it looks like they're getting animals and they're in a river and they're a canoe. These are just stick figures. There's no words. If you were an archaeologist, you would be so happy. You would go write a big, long paper about it. You, you could show off your discovery. This simple stick figure on a wall would tell you somebody was there. If you see the heart on the beach, it'll tell you somebody was there. Because we know that information doesn't come from nothing. It requires an informant. And for evolution, it has no informant. It has and understands the need for information, but it cannot answer. Their, their, their answer is, well, if you go back and give enough time, then eventually that information can come about. Yeah, we don't believe that in the rest of life. So we believe in literal creation. I believe in a young earth. Um, that's my perspective. Um, I believe that's what the scriptures teach. And for me, that is, that is a final word. Now, we can study science and we can see other things that will point to uh, these conclusions being right and true. And again, there is so much information you can study. But I want to close on a very practical point by turning to Colossians chapter 1. And in Colossians chapter 1, we find out who this, a little more information about this creator of Genesis chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. Now let's back up into verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over cre all creation. It means he's preeminent. For by him all things were created. By Jesus all things were created that are in him and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or principalities, or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Through him, everything that exists was created by the Lord. That's not Genesis. That's the New Testament. Everything was created through him. All that we see in this world was created through the Lord. And not only that, but it was created what? For him. You are a person that has been created in the image of God and you've been created for the purposes of the Lord. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ who created you and you are not living for him, you will never know the fullness and the meaning that you can have in this life. By aligning yourself and submitting yourself to the creator. And some hear this and they resist. They say, what are you talking about? He created for, for him. I'm not going to be anybody's little puppet. Well, God's not asking you to be a puppet. He's asking you to be an object of his love and his eternal purposes. But if you don't want to live for the Lord, you don't have to live for the Lord. He is not manipulating you. He's giving you a free will. And if you say, I don't want to live for the Lord, then you can do that, but it's not recommended. What's recommended is that you submit before the Lord. And who is the Lord? Now, if God is some tyrannical you know, creator who's looking for ways to afflict and torment his creation, then we're all in a bad situation. And yeah, living for him is not an appealing thing. If he is the you know, God of Thomas Jefferson who said, well, he created us in a deistic you know, deist point of view and he went to the other side of the universe and he's left us to fend for ourselves, well, then living for him doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? But if he is a loving creator who sent his son to die upon the cross that we might be redeemed to him, that we might live for him and live for his purposes and he has good waiting for you in this life and the life to come, then 
may I suggest to you that you want to live for him. You want to discover those purposes. Now you say, well, yeah, I know he's, he's created. Yeah, I know the Lord. But are you living for him in a practical way? Are you walking through this life, seeing your energy and your strength and your mind and your ability to reason and your creativity as a creation? Do you see these as things owing to God for his glory and for his honor? Or do you just say, I'm talented, and I'm going to serve myself with my talent. Well, there's more. There is so much more that you can do. Knowing that you're created by God and that you're redeemed by the Lord to follow him. He is not some angry dictator in heaven. You know, Jesus came to this earth, and he says that he came to seek and to save He is a redeemer, but he's not only a redeemer. He says, I'm no longer going to call you servants. I'm going to call you what? My friends. This is how the Lord wants to relate to you. The Lord is intimately aware of everything that's going on in your life. How many times did you stand up yesterday and sit down? Did you count them? How about this past week? How many times did you stand up and sit down? How many times, how many tears have you cried in your lifetime and where are they? Oh, the Lord speaks of knowing those things. God's more interested in you than you are interested in yourself. I I kind of think it's like a little baby that's beginning to walk. You know the risings and the fallings of that, that, that little baby that's beginning to get mobile. If they stand up and take a walk, somebody's going to get a phone call. You're aware. The Lord is aware of you. And he knows when you sit down and when you stand up and when you lie down and you get out of bed. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He collects your tears in a bottle. He knows you better than you know yourself. This is the one who created you. And we should have no fear in following him and living for his glory and his honor. Let's pray. Lord, we are glad to be your creation. We are glad to be those that have purpose and meaning in life. You are not the God of the deists. You are the God of Scripture who is near to your creation. You hear our cries. You tell us to pray to you. You tell us that you will uphold us, that you will comfort us, that you will strengthen us, that you will deliver us, that you will provide for us. Lord, we worship you as creator God that is near and caring and loving. We worship you as creator, redeemer God. Thank you, Lord, for not only creating us, but redeeming us back to yourself. 